So, um, uh, so back to um, uh, our conference. Um, we uh, now have a presentation by uh, Professor Bridge Tanka, uh, who uh, also comes from India, from the, uh, his, uh, at present at the Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi. Uh, actually, uh, Bridge uh, Tanka is um, a specialist of Japan. He's a historian of Japan, and uh, I find it particularly interesting uh, to have the viewpoint of uh, an Indian uh, historian on uh, Japan. Uh, so um, we are going to, to uh, um, have a presentation precisely on uh, Pan-Asianism, which uh, uh, was already mentioned uh, this, uh, this morning. So, Bridge. It's... Thank you, Anne, and thank you for inviting me to this conference. Um, I'll start with uh, my presentation is on uh, Asianism. I, I prefer the word Asianism in the Japanese case to Pan-Asianism because I think uh, Asianism was a little different from other Pan movements. Uh, most of them were anti-colonial. So Asianism was a word that was first used in 1916 by Kodera Kenkichi in an article he wrote, Dai Ajir, on, uh, on Asia. It was an ideology to sustain a multinational colonial empire. By using Asianism, we are drawn into the logic of this ideological category and blinded to the many ways that the <coughs> Japanese were charting their modern paths. I will first look at the understanding of Asia and the ideas subsumed under the rubric of Asianism, which was an important ideological element to galvanize the Japanese population, even as the government worked to create a European-style nation to win recognition from the Western powers. The origins of Pan-Asianism were traced to the late 19th century, and by the early 20th century, the main elements were widely accepted. Oh, there's some characteristics displayed here. The main part of my presentation will deal with three individuals who traveled in Asia and came back with ways to use the ideas they learned there to address the challenges they faced in Japan. I will suggest that the Asian experience was but one element in their intellectual formation, sometimes an important one. The intellectual complexion of these individuals and others like them were shaped by diverse global and national currents that are often ignored when debates are framed within the rubric of Asianism. The idea of Asia is a colonial construction, but it has taken a life of its own. Intertwined at times with earlier histories, the Asian discourse marks out the region of Asia as defined by certain values, family, religion, harmony with nature, sloth, imitativeness, the stranglehold of tradition, and so on and on. The combinations change, but the idea of a definable Asia persists. In Japan, East of Toyo originally referred to Japan and the surrounding seas, but in the Meiji period, that's post-1868, it came to be associated geographically with Japan, China, and India, and then with Asia or the Orient. Japan found in the idea of Asia a weapon to meet the challenges posed by Western powers <coughs> and their claims to superiority. More than any other feeling of commonality, this instrumental use was dominant. In East Asia, despite the overarching unity provided by Chinese culture, and language, there are marked differences in the region. To take one example from Japan in the writings of uh, Nishikawa Joken, an astronomer and geographer who wrote uh, many things, but amongst them he wrote a book on 42 nationalities, probably deriving a lot of the information from some Western sources. This is in 1720s. He wrote about 42 nationalities with drawings to illustrate their dress and manner. He differentiated between those who were part of the Chinese cultural acumen, defined by the use of Chinese characters, the practice of the three teachings, eating rice, and the use of chopsticks, and those who were not part of this order. Here he's showing, these are from Ryukyu's or modern day Okinawa. So they're considered mostly Chinese rather than Japanese. He found affinity with those who were part of the larger Chinese cultural sphere, but the others were set apart. But even as this idea of a shared culture was a powerful influence and the Chinese language and culture highly regarded, 
and Japan contested China's role as a preeminent power in the region. It questioned the idea of China as central. Uh, this is India. The foundational text for the ideas of uh, Ajya Shugi or Asianism is a short article called the Datsua Ron. It was a newspaper article written by the modernizer Fukuzawa Yukichi in 1885. He called for expelling Asia, Datsua, meaning to get out, transcend, leave, uh, from, uh, to expel Asia from Japan. Asia representing all that was backward and the West, are, and more importantly, the US rather than just uh, Europe and uh, Britain, the US was considered as a sort of epitome of uh, democracy and modernity, which is very strange considering both modernized about the same time. Um, so expelling Asia was later expanded to expel Asia and become Western. In tactical opposition to this, the idea of ally with Asia to fight the cultural domination of the West arose. Uh, this is some extracts from that article. It bears noting that Fukuzawa's article <laughs> evoked no comment at the time it was written. And it's only in the 1950s and 1960s that it emerges as an example of Japanese militarism. In this period, the late 19th century, Japan was beginning its imperial expansion. A host of societies sprang up to work to build and strengthen connections with Asia. Isn't the Shinai Shao, the new Asia, established by Okubo Toshimichi, 1883, the Aja Kyokai or Asia Association, 1898, the Ikashi Aja Dobunkai, the East Asia uh, Cultural Association, with uh, Konoe Fumimaru as head, so he's a very important figure. The intellectual foundations of, there's a number of these societies and people involved in trying to build links with Asia. The intellectual foundations of these societies was based on the idea of an East Asian community and was premised on <coughs> theories of society and social progress articulated by scholars such as Shimei Masamichi and Kada Tetsuji. They argued that a new intellectual order must be based on the spirit of science and it was the responsibility of larger ethnic groupings that had a historically progressive character to assess the progress of smaller and more backward ethnic groups. So they reject racial hierarchies. Uh, the modern idea of race has entered Japan, but there's some debate about this. Uh, but this rejection is of racial hierarchies is important. In the 1910s, Japan's economic and business interests increased in Southeast Asia, and the Association of Southern Sea was established. In 1919, the first use of Tonan Aja, or Southeast Asia, uh, appears in a textbook. These developments led to the new Greater East Asian Order by 1938, which was expanded to include Southeast Asia in 1940. This idea of Greater East Asia, Daitoa, underlined Japan's belief in its role as leader of Asia, but with defeat in World War II, this idea was marginalized for a while. It continues in different forms today. Now let me start with the first individual. He's a monk, Kitabata Kedoryu. The accounts of Japanese Buddhists who traveled to India in the late 19th and early 20th century show their dilemma between seeking to be part of a Buddhist community and their sense of being Japanese and apart. As Buddhists, they were pilgrims to a sacred land, but as Japanese nationalists, they saw themselves on the front lines of the battle against Western imperial domination. As members of a colonial empire, they saw India as a dying nation, materially weak and spiritually emasculated, reinforcing their belief in the superiority of their Eastern Buddhism. The growing nationalist discourse was beginning to constrain the universalism of Buddhism, but it had yet to stifle it completely. The first Japanese to come to India, Kitabatake Doryu, brings out the contested relationship between Japan and other parts of Asia. He is what I would categorize as a colonial pilgrim. Kitabadake traveled through Europe and the US between 1881 and 84. And on his return journey, he spent a month in India. Soon after he returned to Japan in January 84, he quickly published accounts of his travels to India. There are actually three of them. The first, 
is Master Pita Bhattake's Doryu's India Travels, a one-page account that publicized his pilgrimage to the Buddha's tomb <laughs> to a wide audience. Then he wrote uh, very quickly after that a travel diary of a world tour, again subtitled The History of Sakyamuni's Tomb in March 84. And then in 86, a more longer account, Things Seen en Route to India. Despite the fact that he spent most of his time in Austria and England and America, his writing is all about India. Even so, that's because there was a growing interest among Buddhist groups in Indian Buddhism. Kitabatake describes India as the most dangerous place in the world, where wild animals and bandits abound. The people are black, naked, and uncivilized. There was an interest in the India. So it's, uh, there's a growing interest among certain sections in Japan. And we find, for instance, particularly an interest in Ashoka. The idea that here's a ruler who renounces war becomes very important. Uh, the novelist Mori Ogai actually wrote a biography of Ashoka in 1909. And the Buddhists, uh, this Nishi Honganji, established a hospital in Tokyo called the Ashoka Hospital. Kitabatake claims, uh, mistakenly, to have been at the excavation of the tomb of the Shakyamuni. In fact, he was not in Kushinagar, but in Bodh Gaya, the place where, as you can understand, here's a leading monk who has no idea of where the Buddha was born or died. This woodblock print, which was used in one of his books, I'm sorry, it's in black and white, but uh, used to depict the performance of the rituals which Kitabatake is supposed to be carrying out. He's the middle figure in Japanese robes. Uh, behind him is a Japanese who accompanied him in Western clothes, and then the naked savages in the back. Uh, the image of Shakyamuni is conflated with the images of the Amida, Amitabh, the central object of worship of the, for the Jodo Shinshu sect to which Kitabatake belonged. So looking at this and his accounts of India, we get one image of Kitabatake. However, it's important to understand his full life because I think it's very different. Kitabatake came to India at the tail end of his career. He was a high-ranking monk with uh, very close ties to the ruling authorities, both in his domain and in other domains. He played a very important role in domainal reforms as the Han uh, were meeting the challenges of uh, Western intrusion. They were undergoing a variety of changes. And Kitabatake was instrumental in helping to reform the administration. But in particular, he established a militia of monks and peasants to take up arms to protect the country. It's the first time uh, this happens, and it breaks the monopoly of the samurai who had the right to bear arms. Uh, in 1868, he studied German and German legal texts in Kyoto. During this period, he was a key figure with wide links in other domains and part of the group that wanted to transform his sect into a modern religious organization. And they carry out a number of reforms which predate the Meiji reforms. In other words, they separate the governing of the sect from the ruler, the head of the, priest, the, head of the sect. He's, uh, it's now the sect establishes a democratically elected body which then runs the sect. Uh, they set up a university to teach science and maths and English not just to the monks, but to uh, the laity as well. But the uh, conservatives in the temple fought back, and the reforms ended in 1879. Uh, this backlash also forced Kitabatake to leave Kyoto, and he went to Tokyo, where he set up the Kitabatake Law Center. <coughs> he wrote textbooks, initiated a curriculum to improve the priest and strengthen national principles. While he saw the importance of the imperial institution, he brought in Democrats such as Oi Kentaro to teach at the school. He was again forced out from here for a variety of reasons, but the law center then becomes a Meiji University. Uh, on its website, it doesn't mention anything about Kitabatake <coughs> today. When he returned, so it's at this point of time that the temple authorities send Kitabatake on a world tour. They want to get him out of the way. Uh, he's a an important figure, and he's intrusive. Uh, when he returned, after uh, through his writings and speaking, 
he became a popular and influential monk. He left the Buddhist sect and went on to lecture along with his uh, then partner Nishimaki Sakuya, a people's rights activist, a, a woman who had, was a Democrat and fighting for constitutional government. On the need for educating women and their spiritual autonomy, that becomes the focus of his lectures in uh, northern Japan. This uh, rich political and religious life can hardly be confined within the bounds of Ajashugi or Asianism. <laughs> the second uh, person I'd like to look at is Ito Chuta. Uh, he's an architect, historian, uh, who played a key role in defining religious architecture and in laying down the principles for conservation. He's also closely linked with the Nishi Honganji, the same temple that Kitabatake belongs to. Uh, and he worked with Otani Kozui, who was the head of this uh, religious organization, the Nishi Honganji. Otani was, a, as you can see from this picture, was a Buddhist prince given a modern education. Uh, he's well known for his personally funded expeditions to Central Asia to explore the transmission of Buddhism to Japan. English, I think, Baron Otani is uh, usually the word name used. Otani was actually countering the European Orientalists and claiming his right as a Buddhist to search for these connections. Otani, the explorer and reformer, found a kindred spirit in Ito. Ito Chuta was part of a generation helping to establish architecture as a professional discipline and architects as different from traditional builders. His graduation essay was on architectural philosophy and he argued that it was a fine art against the then dominant idea that building studies was part of engineering. Ito sought to define a truly Japanese style for the future while at the same time meeting the demand for systematic knowledge in the context of social progress. Architecture for Ito was located in history, and so while respecting the past, he could also accept the present, even though the two were always in tension. As was the then practice, the Ministry of Education used to send uh, students, once they graduated, to Europe to study further. Ito refused. He wanted to go to Asia. The ministry said, what will you do in Asia? You can't go there to learn anything. But uh, he was... Uh, um, firm and fixed in his opinions, and after a few years, the ministry relented and said, well, okay, go to Asia, but at the end, you must get to Europe. So he traveled through China, Southeast Asia, India, Turkey, and then did get, go to Europe. Uh, so between 1902 and 1905, uh, he was traveling in Asia. The ministry was quite generous in its funding. Uh, he returned to Japan in 1905, writing that his objective in traveling was to understand the principles of Japanese architecture. I won't go into it, but he, he goes on a misconception. He's trying to figure out how he thinks the Greek and Japanese architecture are related, and he's trying to trace the influence. Uh, let me briefly take up Ito's experience in India. His detailed travel notes and drawings are a rich, if unexplored source. He treats Indian art and architecture not as an anthropologist, but as a practice whose principles he must understand. Unlike most Japanese travel accounts, there is an active engagement with the cultures he encountered, and his notes are enlivened by sketches of the people he met and the places he saw. Uh, as you can see, he has a sense of humor. Um, uh, this is, uh, that's him sitting in a Buddha pose, uh, probably in Burma somewhere. Uh, here, he has, uh, I managed to see some of his, actually, copies of the records, and they wouldn't open out the originals. It's a complicated process. But uh, here are, you know, fairly lifelike drawings of people. Uh, he's written his notes uh, in Hindi, in Urdu, in Roman letters. This is in Banaras. Uh, here's a set of people with their names below some of the names. Most Japanese travel accounts rarely mention names. Uh, they usually deal with, uh, you know, luggage carriers and so forth. There's a, it's a high-born Bengali woman. That's uh, Ito behind the photographer. He has uh, a lot of these. But you can see the extensive notes on Jain architecture and many other things. 
three themes run through Ito's account of India, the beauty and perfection of ancient art and architecture, the state of modern cities, and an ass assessment of India's society and people. Uh, his graduation thesis shows that he was familiar with the Western scholarly work on Indian art and architecture and came well informed. He traveled across much of India and was particularly impressed by the uh, temples he saw in Orissa, writing that to understand the principles of aesthetics, it's necessary to go to Orissa and study the art and architecture there. He was moved by the sculpture of Khajara, which other travelers found morally offensive. In Elora, not only was he impressed by the immense effort that went into the massive sculptures, but also by their beauty. The Kailash temple, he writes, <coughs> is not just another temp beautiful temple amongst many beautiful temples, but it is an extraordinarily beautiful building. He compares its beauty to the abstract beauty of Greek sculpture. Ito found India poor in the standard of living low, writing that even well-off Indians dress worse than the lowest Japanese, and they're mostly illiterate. He saw caste restrictions as preventing change and the creation of a modern way of thinking. Having just come from China, it's natural that he compares his experience and understanding, but neither emerge as people for whom, whom he has any sympathy or affection. He writes uh, that both the Indians and Chinese have an excessive desire for money, while Indians are more superstitious and lazy. Uh, Ramda, the, uh, this word occurs in a lot of Kalun texts about the natives being lazy. They bathe more than the Chinese. However, he found the Indian habit of wearing shoes in their homes dirty, and he writes, like a lot of primitive people, they fight a lot. Uh, he notes that given the different climates in India and China, the eating habits are also different. He found India fundamentally different from Japan, so much so that he felt that the two had nothing in common, but politeness prevented him from expressing this, as he found that Indians liked the Japanese. The ambiguity of his appreciation of India is best represented by his views on Mysore, where he found the attention to detail in the stone sculpture incomparable, but argued that this revealed the Indian character, waste a great deal of effort in small details. Otani and Ito both found Indian architecture particularly Mughal, worth emulating. In this, they were in agreement with the English architect Josiah Kondo, who would come to Japan. Kondo saw architecture as not just engineering, but art, and so placed emphasis on giving modern improvements to traditional buildings. Kondo was a student of Roger Smith, who was among those British architects who saw Mughal buildings as examples of a properly grand imperial architecture. Smith argued that English architecture lacked this quality and should use Mughal embellishments to project British imperial power. And he called for an architecture that would serve both as a rallying point for ourselves and as raising a distinctive mark of our presence, always to be beheld by the natives of the country. Smith's disciples built in a style that came to be called Indo-Sasenic. Kondo used the Indo-Sasenic style to add decorative elements to Western style buildings, but his ideas did not find ex ready acceptance in the Japanese establishment. Ito also came to appreciate not just Mughal architecture, but the many styles he encountered in his extensive travels in Asia, and brought these influences back to create some unique buildings. The Skiji Honganji, this is the temple in of the Nishi Honganji in Tokyo. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of Indian and Southeast Asian elements in uh, this building. But it's not only the, uh, the building, the structure, but also in his extensive use of imaginary animals in his buildings that echo, that echo figures from across the Asian region. It's a very distinctive feature and playful character that of Ito's architecture. Uh, for instance, this is the uh, Honganji Dendoin in Kyoto, uh, opposite the Honganji Temple. <coughs> Ito also worked with the then head uh, Otani Kozui, who was trying to reform the uh, Honganji uh, to build an alternative headquarters in Kobe to move away from the conservative influences in Kyoto. And this building represented for Otani Kozui a site for creating a reformed Buddhism and Ito designed it to reflect a pan-Asian architectural synthesis filtered through a Western colonial lens. Ito became a prominent op uh, proponent of what is called imperial crown style. So this building, as you can see, it's a uh, uh, British-style building built with Mughal 
arches and domes. Uh, and the, this is the India Room. Oh, oh, sorry, this is mistitled. It's a Chinese, China Room, Shina. Shina uh, this is the Arabian uh, Room. Oh, that both I forgot, in, I think I missed the India Room. Anyway, the India Room looks much like this. This is a China Room. Um, and this is the garden. Unfortunately, it was all destroyed in a fire, so these photographs are only from a catalog. Uh, after the 20s, the 1920s, uh, uh, there was a Shimada, an architect, tried to propose this design for the National Diet Building. So it's a neoclassical building with Japanese-style roofs, but it was rejected. But from the 30s, this style becomes uh, quite uh, important. Um, so, so this, I think, this encounter between Ito, Asia, and Otani Kozi, the religious head, and the architectural building reflects another way that uh, Asian influences were being used by people as they uh, began to learn about these countries. The third person I'd like to look at is Kaneko Mitsuharu. He's a very different person. He's a poet uh, who came to maturity as the Japanese empire was expanding. But his thinking was at odds with the prevailing nationalism. His intellectual and poetic journey reflects his critical stance against power and his opposition to war and exploitation. Kaneko writes that it's not possible to understand my emotional life without taking into account that I grew up between the Sino-Japanese and the Russo-Japanese wars. A precocious child, he developed an interest in Greek and Roman history and classical Japan at a very early age. In school, uh, he studied science, French, and became a much awarded painter. He studied in a school set up by the French priests, Marists. Uh, he was drawn to all things Western. The West appeared to be a bright, unconstrained, separate world. However, Kaneko soon tired of the Marist educational approach of his school. He found the emphasis on cramming dispiriting, and within a year, he was even displeased with the French language. He then began to turn to the old world, reading the Chinese classics, particularly of the pre chin period, even giving himself a Chinese name. He seriously thought of becoming a Confucian scholar. His reading of Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu, as well as Edo fiction, turned him in quite another direction. On top of this serious engagement with classical and popular literature, he found a new world in the writings of Walt Whitman and Edward Carpenter. Uh, Walt Whitman's poem, it's an extract, uh, to a common prostitute was a revelation, and Carpenter's towards democracy introduced him to socialism. Kaneko is perhaps most moved by the emphasis on equality that he found in these writers. Though actually, if you read the whole poem, it's uh, Reading it today it doesn't sound all that impressive, but anyway. Uh, Kaneko was perhaps most moved by the emphasis on equality that he found in these writers. He also began to read Blake, uh, the Blake studies that Yanagi Soets, the founder of the Minge movement, the cra uh, craft movement in Japan, was producing during this time. Kaneko's first trip to Europe was immediately after the end of the First World War. He spent time in England, and then he went on to Belgium, where he spent some time. Here, he began to read poets like Emile Verheeren, a Belgian poet, from whom he learned about structure and sustained rhythm. He read the French symbolists, Baudelaire, and other writings. When he finally arrived in Paris, he was underwhelmed, finding the town a little dilapidated compared with the, what he called the glass capital of Brussels. He returned to Japan in 21 at a time when anti-Chinese feelings were very high. In the Great Kanto earthquake, the Great Earthquake of, uh, in Tokyo in 1923 was a turning point for Kaneko, who saw it not just as a simple disaster, <coughs> but one that showed him that the new order which made the Meiji had erected in a makeshift fashion was gradually stripped of its finish, and the incompetence of the groundwork was revealed. Opposition movements seemed to increase in strength, but Kaneko felt that even the socialists, with whom now he was very sympathetic, were quick to be enraged or indignant, but did not think things through. Kaneko felt that he had a better understanding of the past, so he was better placed to recognize its evils. In December 28, he went on his second trip to Europe, 
he goes through Shanghai and Singapore, and uh, he spent some time in uh, Singapore, and from Singapore, he went into the interiors of Malaya. And uh, in the interiors of Malaya, he uh, writes, my eyes saw not the strange scenes of the South, but the wretchedness of the native population in their blood-stained rags. He writes, he lived much like a native. I had descended to the level of the native population. I lived gorging curry with my fingers and eating satay by the roadside. So he felt he was becoming closer to the local population and their way of life. He returned to Singapore where he begins to read Lenin on imperialism and interestingly, Max Turner as well. And he wrote that the conditions that these writers were discussing was something that he could see before his own eyes. Before him, there were no better samples of men worn out by exploitation and forced labor than those before my eyes. So he's gra gradually becoming politicized uh, as he, you know, through sees, uh, what he sees in these colonies. During this period, his friends in Japan had no idea where he was, or even if he was alive. Rumors were that he was playing drums in a jazz band in India. He arrived in Paris quite destitute and so took up whatever earned him some money, writing doctoral theses, picture framing, packing cases for tourists, peddling, translating, and painting. However, he stayed away from the politics and notes that he was quite ignorant of the rising tide of fascism either in Europe or Japan. He returns to Japan in 32, but since he didn't have too much money, he stopped over in Singapore and again goes into the interiors of Malaya too. He used to paint and he used to make a living by selling often erotic paintings which sold well. He would have settled down, he says, and he writes that listening uh, to the sounds of the swishing of the nipa palms, the cries <coughs> of the large-billed birds, the wails of wild monkeys were more dear to me than the sounds of my native land. But his son was ill and so he decides to return to a Japan where the political atmosphere was telling violently anti-democratic. Uh, he now begins to write more political poetry. He uh, makes a short trip to China in August 37, and he was there till 1938, where he became friends with a large number of writers and activists, vagabonds and intellectuals, people like uh, Nishida Mitsugu, Lu Shun, Yu Dafu. Uh, Lu Shun seemed to have left a deep mark on Kaneko. Kaneko writes of Lu Shun that he showed him the importance of Taoist thought saying that China was Taoist before it became Confucius. Lu Xun, as Kaneko writes, skillfully whittled down China stroke by stroke and held it out for me to see. Uh, he comes back and it publishes a powerful critique of war. It's a poem called The Shark, Sharks, Same, in the magazine Bungay uh, Literary Arts. A structurally complex poem that narrates the history of East-West conflicts as viewed through the experience of his travels in Southeast Asia the sharks can be head, war-headed torpedoes or Japanese colonialists. He ends the poem with the recognition of his powerlessness. The seal that doesn't like seals, but he is still the seal that he is, except a seal looking the other way. In China, he saw the familiar problems of the exploitation of the local population. This experience confirmed his opposition to the war and to the idea of the righteousness of the Japanese cause. He argued that it was the trade of militarists to go to war. And that is why it was natural for them to lead Japan down this path. But equally, he recognized that the ambition of the militarists and policymakers was supported by the Japanese people. Uh, he went on to write a number of other poems. Uh, Ava of Foam was an exposure of Japanese army atrocities, angels. Uh, Tenshi was a rejection of conscription and pacifist in its ideas. Family Crests was an analysis of the feudal nature of Japan. Uh, by the way, Yudafu drew the cover for his uh, shark's poem. Uh, he drew the shark. During his trip to North China, Kaneko took the critical view that Japan's aggression cannot be justified as a response to Western imperialism. He argued that war was a trade for soldiers, but there was popular support. Only when the people began to suffer privation, they began to claim they opposed these policies. However, while the war was going well, the great majority had pretty positive and frenzied opinions and smothered their opponents. Kaneko argued that the responsibility for the war belonged to everyone. But even today, after the end of World War II, the idea that it was not so shameful still persists. Kaneko writes that he was surprised by how submissive the people had become. The Meiji people, uh, he thought, were quite hot-headed. People who would burn police boxes to oppose a 
one cent uh, rise in fares, but now, that's in the 30s and 40s, they have succumbed so tamely. Astounded by the underlying strength of Meiji national education, which had inculcated patriotism in primary school, Kaneko turned to explore the writings that undergirded the strident nationalism of the times, Norinaga, Atsutane, Sato Nobuhiro, and others. This reading, far from turning him into a nationalist, reinforced his anti-authoritarian ideas. In 1940, he published a tra travelogue of Malaya and the Dutch East Indies, which documented Southeast Asia not as a tropical paradise, but an area of abandoned rubber plantations, Japanese clubhouses, and native laborers, coolies, prostitutes, and those subsisting at the lowest levels of society. Kaneko makes this opposition to the war quite clear. The poem, a Bowl of Rice, makes his position clear that it's not imperial glory that is important for the Japanese, but the livelihood of the ordinary people. Just a bowl of rice with lacquered chopsticks is as tall as snow-capped Fuji, Japan's main food for generations. May the bowl of rice not be hidden by the cloud. May war not spoil it, nor crumble it into pieces. In the period after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, the Literary Patriotic Society was working on inviting writers, and they would have a number of discussions in which Kaneko participated, but he opposed the ideas that they were putting forward. He was particularly opposed to the proposal that writers from the co-prosperity sphere, when they came to Japan, should bow to the imperial palace and read pamphlets about Hakko Ichu. This is a, Hakko Ichu is a key slogan uh, of the militarists, uh, the world under one roof. Uh, Kaneko had many differences because of his critical stance as his travels to Ch in China and Southeast Asia had brought him into contact with the everyday violence of Japanese coloni colonialism and inspired his passionate critique. He withdrew from the organizing committee in December 42. Unlike many of his compatriots who were shocked when the war ended, he writes that he put on St. Louis blues on a gramophone and danced about in the excess of our delight. Uh, Bridge, are we quickly. moving to, yeah, okay. to the conclusion, please? So, yeah. so uh, I can, well, let me end with this. I can think of no better way of ending than recalling the society that ex exiled Indians and Chinese established in Tokyo, the Asian Solidarity Society. It brought together people from other parts of the Philippines, Korea, as, as well as Japanese. The society grew out of a meeting that the Indians had held to commemorate Shivaji as a nationalist hero who had fought the Mughal Empire. One of the uh, key founders, Liu Shepei, uh, writes, he argued that today Asia is united by its shared cultural experience, the Chinese language for Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, of Buddhism from India, which has spread all over Asia, of Islam, which has spread from the Arabs to Persia and India, the presence of Muslims and Indian Brahmins in the southern seas, and to the familiarity of Indians and Filipinos with British and American culture. So he envisioned a region bound by the solidarity of people rather than the domination of a state. In some ways, it reflected the thinking of the Indian scholar and savant Binoy Kumar Sarkar. Sarkar argued that even without trade and exchange, Asia was bound by a polytheistic mode of thinking, which he saw as superior to monotheism, just as republicanism is better than autocracy. This rich past speaks to the challenges we face today of reviving or sustaining the idea of solidarity in a world driven by violent nationalism. The people I talked about, Kitabatake, Ito Chuta, and Kaneko Mitsuharu, in their own ways were feeling uh, these very same challenges. Uh, the current uh, style seems to be to make slogans. So I thought when thinking about China's uh, No Belt, Many Roads initiative, we can offer an alternative of no belt uh, and uh, many roads. So what could be no bar? Thank you.